define what we're talking about. What is interpretation of tongues? The interpretation of tongues is a supernatural ability given by the Holy Spirit to enable the believer to understand a language being spoken, earthly or heavenly, without having first learned it. Uh, I know that when you spend time with some of your mainline uh, Christian friends, they have questions and things about the Holy Spirit, and particularly tongues and interpretation, the gifts. I also know that you have some questions yourself. When we talk about the um, the gift of tongues and then, of course, interpretation of tongues, we, we want to be able to, with the knowledge we're going to receive today, to be able to, first of all, answer our own questions so that we feel it comfortable and at peace with what God's doing through us. And then secondly, we want to be able to answer the questions of others because most of us and most people who are going to open their minds to what God's really doing today in the spirit is going to be the result or the product of understanding. You know, we all want to just jump in there and receive what God has. But other people are just like us. There are multiple reasons why sometimes we have trouble actually receiving right off the truth. Not that truth isn't pristine and powerful, but there are many reasons. Others, we've seen bad examples. We've, we've been taught wrong things. And so the people in our lives that we minister to and that we come in contact with who so desperately need the supernatural touch of God on their life, but also need to learn to walk in it, receive it and walk in it themselves, they're going to be better helped if we can give them some answers. Um, <clears throat> I remember, I'll give you an example of this. I remember growing up, I grew up in a, in a Southern Baptist home, and I, my family is Southern Baptist, far back as we can tell, you know. Um, and uh, Southern Baptist pastors, ministers, deacons, the whole thing. And I remember growing up in, in our home, and basically anything that was in the realm we're talking about was considered of the devil. I mean, it was that... That blasphemous, you know what I mean? Especially speaking in tongues. That was like the big taboo, no, no, if you do that, you ain't a good Baptist, <laughs> and you're on your way to hell. I mean, that's really what they thought, you know? And the funny thing is, is that at the age of, I think I was around 13 or 14, I was saved at nine and genuinely saved. But about, I think I was 13 or 14, my mom and dad, through a series of events, um, ended up in a place in their life where they were having a lot of pressure and stress on them financially. My dad owned multiple stores and uh, was having financial problems because of some construction and different things like that. So a lot of stress, a lot of needs. And so obviously they were reaching out to try to get answers from the Lord. And they loved the Lord. And God, one of the other businesses my dad owned, he owned a... Um, company that made draperies and bedspreads that match and that flower arrangements and, and, the, and he was contracted to a mobile home company and he in other words he would supply all the interior decorating stuff that would match to go in these these mobile homes and it was a good business and plus he had his stores you know well this little old lady pentecostal lady came to work for him as a seamstress up so his business this business was above one of his department stores and of course you know First thing they talk about was the Lord, because he, my dad loved the Lord, but immediately she started telling me about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, and, the, and you know, he's like, at first he's like, that is one crazy little old lady, but you know how God works. And so as time passed, and she would not only share these things with him, but she would talk about how God could, could, could you know, help him and everything. And, you know, to be honest, we were raised that, uh, well, the favorite cliche as a Baptist back then was, uh, the Lord helps those that helps themselves. Yeah. And that was about as spiritual as you could get. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so <clears throat> that's kind of where my mom and dad. Anyway, long story short, after several months, and mom and dad falling in love with this lady, she coaxed our family to visiting her church, which it just so happened that her son was the pastor, and her grandson was coming through to do a revival. And she wanted us to come and hear her grandson. Well, this was a full-blown backwoods Pentecostal church. The only thing they didn't have was snakes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank the Lord. My dad had been out of there in a second. 
But they was wild, man. Well, this preacher guy, he got, he ran back and forth on the altars. You know about how they used to do. I mean, he was throwing down, boy. And the funny thing was, is my dad was just captivated by it. He felt the anointing, you know, something that was familiar to him, but he'd really probably never felt before, you know. And uh, it just captivated him. We went back every night that week. And so, anyway, long story short, in the end, my mom and dad, they didn't actually go and get prayed for in that meeting, but they had all, what, what had already begun to, you, you, God, you know how God does. He just, all these little links, you know. Uh, they had started going to this Friday night prayer meeting, and it was a bunch of Baptist people that had gotten the Holy Ghost. And they were, they were praying, laying hands and stuff. It was, it was kind of low key. Y'all understand what I mean? Totally opposite of the Pentecostal thing. But yet it was in the same direction. <coughs> well, on the following Friday night after this week of revivals, mom and dad asked to get prayed for, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, anyway, it was a beautiful experience. I happened to be there and I got baptized in the Holy Ghost too. My story was this. For me, it wasn't that difficult. I just began to pray in tongues and receive. But for my mom and dad, it took about an hour to an hour and a half to get them both. But they were, they were having, the Holy Spirit was having to work with them. Y'all know what I'm saying? There's so much wrong teaching, so much, um, just all kinds of stuff. Anyway, then my mom and dad received. And well, actually, I think they both received there. And I know some people don't agree with this, but my dad didn't actually pray in tongues for about another couple weeks. Um, but his whole countenance changed. His whole outlook on life changed. To me and to our family, he was a totally different man. So we believe he received that night. He just was having trouble with his prayer language. So anyway, um, <clears throat> that's the story. The reason I tell that story is uh, is because um, we see how that's a lot of the people we're going to minister to are going to be resistant to what we have to offer. And we know the reality of it because we have walked it and experienced it. So it's important that when we present these lessons that it's not that we don't, we're not all just focused on the outcome. I mean, ultimately that's the reason we're learning is so that we can minister to people and there are results in people's lives and in our own life. But we also want to grasp the fact that it's really important that what we study here we learn because this is really going to be the key. Knowledge unlocks, uh, closed doors. It's, it, you know, you, the scripture even talks about the key of knowledge. And knowledge unlocks closed doors. And I know from my family, especially my father, what brought him to the place to receive. The reason I'm where I am today, and my brother's where he is today in a church just like all of ours, is because of the knowledge that shifted our family from one place to another place spiritually. And once it did, everybody in our family now is in the same flow or the same vein which is where we're all li living and worshiping now. Um, so that's why I'm saying this. So what is it? It's, it is the supernatural ability given by the Holy Spirit to enable the believer to understand a language being spoken, earthly or heavenly, without having first learned. Now, the Scripture teaches, actually, and it gives us a strong indication also in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that there are multiple languages in the universe. It, it, it shows us there in the first three verses uh, that, uh, that uh, this is chapter 13, did I mention that? That there are languages that even angels have a language that is their own. So there's a, there's a, there are multiple languages. Sometimes the message of tongues that, that is given could be any language on the earth that's, that's known or unknown, or it could even be an angelic angel, okay? And sometimes people will want to know, they'll say, well, where, where do these lang languages come from? But there are, according to the Bible, they're languages which means they exist. We may not understand the language. Uh, typically, we don't. That's the whole point. But we've all read stories or heard stories or even perhaps been present when someone would pray in tongues in a language they didn't know. And it's, it's, it's very commonly happened that someone in the crowd spoke that language and would, in, would translate or say, and I don't mean the spiritual translation, I mean literally it's a language, and they say, that's my mother tongue. And, and what they just spoke is perfect. I've heard them even say perfect even with accent. So, you know, these are just confirmations that the Holy Spirit uses 
uh, languages that are real languages. Because <clears throat> some people will ask you that sometimes. Another reason we know that it is is because on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples came down out of the upper room, out into the uh, city where where multitude of Jews from all over the world were gathered, over 3,000 get saved. They're from all different backgrounds and languages. But the scripture says that when Peter spoke and when they spoke, that they heard in their own language. Okay, So this gives us a little bit of an indication too about uh, tongues and interpretation. It's possible sometimes for the interpretation to come by the Holy Spirit so that the person hearing actually hears it in their own language. But we, we kind of understand that more to be used um, in situations like happened on that day, on the day of Pentecost, okay? Uh, and so, you know, but we understand that today, typically when God uses us, we don't know what language we speak. I pray in tongues, but I don't know what the language is. But I can definitely tell you that uh, it's recognizable to me. In other words, the only time my prayer language changes is when I'm really in intercession. I can tell that it's like the spirit of intercession takes over and I can hear it begin to change and the other words begin to come. But at the same time, otherwise I kind of recognize my language because I've been praying since I was 13 or 14 in tongues. So there are languages. Uh, it is a gift. The, it is the gift of interpretation. First Corinthians twelve ten, and uh, of course I know that we have have read this chapter multiple times over the last nine months. But it says to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So uh, we are talking about right now specifically tongues that can be translated or in, are intended to be translated and they're used there are typically two ways that they are going to come they're either going to come in your personal prayer time and god wants to reveal to you the interpretation or the other and probably the most common is for public worship and public edification and that's when you hear somebody pray out loud in church or in a in a gathering of believers in tongues and then the interpretation comes. Uh, remember, it is an interpretation. It's not a transliteration. All right? The difference is, is a transliteration is word for word. Uh, you know, most of you know that I have a, a minor in deaf ministry and sign language. In Even in most languages, including to the deaf, you can interpret through using that, that was sign language that I just did. And it's an interpretation. However, you can also do what, what they call C signs. And C signs is a transliteration. That's where <clears throat> literally if Mary is talking and I'm translating for her, I'm saying exactly word for word every word that she says. That's a transliteration. Here's the problem with transliterations. If he's deaf, he's never heard English in its proper sentence structure. Now, he's probably learned how to read it, and he understands it to a degree, but he better relates to an interpretation, which means that I'm going to translate what sh she's saying into a way that's more understandable for him. And that's what you do. I don't care if you're speaking in, from, from English to Spanish, from Spanish to French, it doesn't matter. You normally interpret, because the point is, is getting the message clearly to the person, or we sometimes call it the spirit of the message. The, the Really, the only time transliteration is ever used is sometimes now in some of the English schools, they will require the um, interpreter to transliterate for some of the children who are first learning to read. Okay, And really, they understand this is temporary because ultimately with, with deaf children, you're going to have to teach them their own language, which is sign language and which is typically going to be uh, translated uh, through interpretation. Okay, So the reason, why am I telling you this? Because a lot of times people, when they're first trying to understand what gifts are about, especially the gift we're talking about today, they'll say, well, I don't understand that. That, in, that interpretation was shorter than that message in tongues. 
Or they'll say the opposite. The message in tongues was long, but the interpretation was really short. I don't think that's really real. Okay. See, I'm just, I'm just trying to address some little issues that people often have that become stumbling blocks to them. And we want to explain to them that even, that it, it, it's the interpretation of tongues. It's not the transliteration. Um, and so God uses the vessel. He uses the individual who's interpreting the message to make the translation. In other words, God will drop the, the message in our heart so to speak, or in our mind, and then we're going to verbally relate it. Well, you're going to say it how you normally talk. Now, I know back in the old days, they, they used to in, prophesy and interpret messages in tongues in the old Elizabethan English, you know. Thus saith the Lord, thou art my holy child. Come forth, wretched one. You know, well, that's really innocent people who were taught religiously how to do things. But actually what God really wants to do is God is a God who he created the cultures. When he separated the people at the Tower of Babel, 70 different nations went all over the world. And through time they developed their own languages. And we have those languages present today. And of course obviously we have languages that have changed over time, but the, in the root of their language, those 70 different tribes are still present, even though the languages have been altered some. You know, we add different words every year to our language. So anyway, um, God just wants us to speak to our own culture in the best way that they can understand, because he's a personal God. God created culture. He honors culture. So if you... Um, our translating message, just be yourself, amen, and just share what God is sharing, amen. Um, so it's not an exact word-for-word -word explanation. It's a message that's being communicated. The, the next point here, the purpose of the gift. Tongues with interpretation is a sign to the unsaved believer. It's a sign to the unsaved believer. Verse 22 of chapter uh, 14 says, tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers and not for unbelievers. So there is a clear distinction here that tongues is specifically for the unsaved. It's a sign to the unsaved. Now, obviously, like any gift, anytime God opens his mouth, it's going to bless everybody, right? So when it happens in church, it's going to be a blessing to everybody. It's going to edify everybody. As a matter of fact, anything God does is going to bless everybody. You see somebody lay hands on somebody, and they're the one getting the healing, but you're still going to go, oh, man, praise the Lord, right? So we're going to all get edified. But the objective is, with tongues, it is a message to the unbeliever. And we see that as a very clear example Again, in Acts chapter 2, when they come down out of the room, they begin to, to speak, and through tongues, everybody out there that's unsaved Jews from all over the world are impacted and believe. They went back to the different places they came from, and churches were started, and ministries were started, all because of that one day and those that message that was spoken in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it energizes the spiritual atmosphere. And we know that's true. Why? Anytime you bring the Holy Spirit into a situation, anytime the Holy Spirit does anything, how many of you know the Spirit of God fills the house, right? It reveals the mind of the Holy Spirit at that particular time. So the Holy Spirit, he is speaking through tongues and interpretation to a relative issue at the moment. At the moment. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that what the Holy Spirit is saying is going to be applicable right then. Okay? Applicable right then. All right? Now, if it's prophecy, it can be applicable right then. But it, because why? Because prophecy is it's edifying, it's comforting, and it's exhorting. But prophecy can also speak to future events. As far as God says, I'm going to do this in your life. I'm going, I'll just make up something. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to just uh, do incredible things in your life and ministry. For example, see the difference there? Okay, so it energizes, it reveals the mind of the Holy Spirit. It facilitates the release of angelic activity. How many of you know that at the voice of God, both Psalms 
tells us in the New Testament, at the voice of God, angels respond. Yes, Amen? Yes. So what happens? Tongues comes forth. Interpretation comes forth. You hear it. You're blessed. The congregation's blessed. And guess what? Angels go to perform. They, they kick into action at the voice of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that powerful? That's exciting. So the interpretation of tongues is it's a companion to speaking in tongues. The reason we say this is that we know from chapter 14 that any time a message is given in tongues, the scripture says there are some requirements that go along with it. The first one is, is that it must be given with the intent of an interpretation. Okay, so if I feel God is putting on my spirit, my heart, to give a message in tongues, I become the responsible person. I know the Bible says that I'm first, it says first, you know, to make sure there's an interpreter present. Well, that means we should know who the interpreters are. Okay, uh, I'm going to look around the house the minute I feel God moving on me. And if I don't see an interpreter that I know of is present, that doesn't mean there's not one. It just means right now I'm taking a step of accountability. So what's the next thing I must say? I must say if I'm going to give this message, then I need to be prepared to interpret it. Okay, okay. So, so what's the implication? The implication is, is that just because you feel the Holy Spirit move on you, he has a message. There still are some personal requirements. We don't just blurt it out. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I couldn't help myself. The Holy Ghost came on me and I just went off in tongues. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Okay. And that applies to that whole chapter because it's in context, that chapter, which also talks about tongues and interpretation. It actually calls tongues and interpretation equal to the gift of prophecy. Okay, It's not equal if there's no interpretation. As a matter of fact, it causes confusion and it, it disrupts the flow of things. Now, most churches and most bodies of believers are mature enough that if tongues comes forth and people wait and wait and wait and wait and there's never an interpretation, most groups of people are going to be okay because they either know that that person did not know the proper you know, method and they gave a message and they weren't prepared to interpret it. Or they know that it maybe it just simply wasn't the Lord in the first place. Uh, and so let's don't stumble over it. Let's don't get all hung up on one little issue. Let's go on back worshiping God and let's go forward in what we came here for, right? Um, the whole point of the, if it is something to do with the devil, his whole intention is to bring confusion and to disrupt what God's presently doing. So don't give him that, right? All we do is we go right back into action, worshiping God, praising him, and then let the devil take his mess and go on down the road, right? <clears throat> However, for those of us in this class, we know now, if I'm going to give a message, I really need to be prepared to step out in the same kind of faith that I step out when I give the tongues to, to step out and interpret it if no interpretation comes. Okay, uh, So that's a requirement that the Bible puts upon us, and we want to be sensitive. So it's, it's intended to develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit coming upon you in private worship. Uh, this also, I'd like to add also to in ministry, because I know that, <clears throat> I know, and you probably experienced this, you pray in tongues for a little while, and it's like you become more alert to what the Spirit of God is doing and saying. Your prayers will begin to change, because He begins to guide you and lead you. you and I find this also very, very effective in ministry, like praying in the altars and things, um, if God is really directing me to pray over people, lay hands on people, I pray in the Holy Ghost. And when I pray in the Holy Ghost, what it does, first of all, Jude 20, we know, says that it builds up our most holy faith. So what's happening? I start praying in the Holy Ghost, and my faith level is going to start coming up. It's like putting some fresh gasoline in the tank. It's getting full, but this is high octane. Hello? It's high octane. So what's happening? I'm becoming more aware of the spirit realm and more in tune with it because of my faith that level is rising. What that do? Well, you, you, do, you do anything you do in the spirit by faith, right? So what's that going to do? It's going to make me more adapt, more sensitive, more alert to the spirit where I'm going to have more faith to pray in tongues, to interpret, to prophesy, to lay hands on the sick. So I found personally, and I believe this would apply to everybody, you start praying in the Holy Ghost, and give the Holy Spirit time to work in you, 
Because as he begins to work in you, he'll be able to work through you in a greater dimension, a greater capacity. For me, like if I'm praying for people, <clears throat> typically, let's just say that they're in the altar line here and, and I'm, I'm praying for people moving along. I just pray in the Holy Ghost until the Lord gives me something. If he gives me a direction or a word uh, for someone, then, of course, I do that. And then I go immediately right back to praying in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because I'm, and I don't want this to sound it's like it's all mechanical, but I keep that spiritual battery charged. I keep that flow of the Holy Ghost in me, right? Then I move the next person, and if he gives me something, then I give it. He is the Holy Ghost. Don't let, don't let this thing come on you that pressures you and says that you got to do something to everybody a particular way everywhere you go. It's real common. I've even had people say, I don't understand how come that whoever he is in the altar preacher, he prays and prophesies over here, then he skips three or four people and comes over here. Well, what's going on is he feels led of the Holy Spirit. She feels led of God to go to that person over here. They're not intentionally avoiding you. See, they're just being led of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, we just have to trust the Lord. That's what's happening. But sometimes I, I've seen people get upset about it, you know. Well, I was next. <laughs> well, I know, but the Holy Spirit <laughs> is the one who's leading this thing. So we have to trust him in that. Amen. And be sensitive. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, it can reveal what you're praying about in the Spirit because it brings understanding to the mind. What praying in the Holy Ghost? Uh, in public worship, the gifts of tongues and interpretation can bring the church into a flow of the Holy Spirit uh, in the same way that prophecy does. Given at the right time, the message itself will speak to, remember what we said, what's going on at the moment. Okay. So what, what's going on at the moment? If it's during worship, it's worship, right? So we will be somehow, that God, however God chooses, we will be encouraged to worship more, to enter in. To, in other words, it'll have something to do with what's going on. Sometimes you'll ha have it even speak to and encourage uh, in the way that the minister is about to preach, but you don't know it yet. Until they get up to speak, and then you're like, wow, that's what the Holy Ghost just said. And guess what? The preacher probably prepared that last week, you know? Yes, it is possible for the Holy Spirit to speak to your pastor or the minister teaching earlier on before they ever come to church. The, in the old days, they used to say, well, you know, it, you don't know what you're going to say. Matter of fact, some of the old timers wouldn't even study. They said, no, if I study, then, then I'm preaching what I studied, and, and I want the Holy Ghost to speak. And so, you know, they used to make a big deal about that in some of the Pentecostal circles. The pastor would come up there, you know, and he'd just go to preach. And you know what happened? Nine out of ten times, he preached the same message a little bit different every week. Because he didn't, he didn't fill his reservoir with what God was really saying. He, he, yeah, he depended on the Holy Spirit to speak through him. And maybe once in ten, it was really something powerful. But most of the time, the Holy Spirit's going to draw off of what he's already been speaking to you about all week and leading you in. <clears throat> if you witness and stuff, which I hope we all do, and share with people, it's amazing how that God will lead you to talk to people and to witness to people or to pray for people like at work and things and things that you have studied or, or, or been meditating on, you know, previous to that day will all of a sudden be just the perfect word for them. You can say what you want, but that's the Holy Spirit. He set you up earlier in the week to, to get you on that subject, to prepare you so that when you were in the moment of ministry, then the Holy Spirit could draw that thing out and you would know this is what God's saying. So it's real important if you're going to move in the gifts to be in the Word, to spend time with God, because God will speak to you about things and you have no idea at that moment how He's going to use that down the road or in the future. Amen. It's, it's powerful. <clears throat> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And that means if I go to a bank and make a deposit, I can make a withdrawal. And Amen. If I, don't, if I don't make no deposit in my spirit, I, I'm thinking, I ain't got nothing to draw out. That's good, I Philip. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we're talking about tongues interpretation, aren't we? That's a great example you just gave. 
Amen. Let's talk about the word of wisdom now. The word of wisdom. So what is the word of wisdom? Well, our definition, it's an impression, a thought, a mental picture, or a still small voice of the Holy Spirit showing what to do or how to deal with a specific situation. It is wisdom about that one matter at that one time. So a word of wisdom is not typically going to be a whole volume. <laughs> okay, you're not going to sit down and write a book. That's not a word of wisdom. That is multiple paragraphs and pages of wisdom. So typically a word of wisdom will come and it'll be relatively short, but it'll be divine. It'll be like, pow, why didn't I think about that? Well, because you're not the Holy Ghost, <laughs> okay? He knows everything. He's aware of all situations and circumstances you could not know about. Plus, he has the mind of God. So he is able to speak on behalf of God through you into that situation. You cannot come up with something smart to say to, to equal a word of wisdom, okay? However, it's the same principle, we spend time with God and we learn the heart and the mind of God. These are God's thoughts. He said, boy, I wish I knew what God thinks. I'll tell you what he thinks. Everything he wants you to know about what he thinks is right here. If you want to know what God thinks, read this. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> so wisdom will flow out of, again, that deposit Philip talked about that you made, but, but it'll be, it'll be of a divine nature. In other words, you probably won't have thought, man, this is the wisest thing I've ever come across this week. And you're walking around all week thinking, how wise this in, but I don't know who to give it to. I don't know what to do with it. No, more than likely, at the moment God gets ready to use you, boom, it'll just hit you in your spirit and you'll have understanding and you'll go, hey, God's telling me, and they're going to be as amazed as you are at what the Lord has revealed. Amen? This is the kind of thing about a word of wisdom. What's the purpose of this gift? Well, uh, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians says, But the manifestation of spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So, first of all, it's for the same reason that all of the gifts are given. Remember? All of them meet this criteria or provide this type of a result. They profit all, everybody, amen? You're not going to have a, a word come from God, a word of wisdom, that's going to bless and encourage one person and destroy somebody else. No. All things that come from God are good, amen? And they're awesome. So what's the benefit? The benefit is it's a specific word probably to a person or it could be to a corporate group. It could be a word to the church. Let's say the church is struggling in some area and God gives a word of wisdom to the church body. Whoever, whatever, it still will bless anybody that hears it. You know, you can't hear from God and not be blessed. God may be speaking it specifically to Philip, but when I hear it, it's going to be nourishment to my soul. It's going to build my faith. It's going to encourage me. I may not need that word of wisdom at the moment, but I will learn something. I'll receive something that will be powerful that somewhere in my life it can apply. Why? Because it's going to profit everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, so a word of wisdom is given. The, the, uh, the, that's the powerful thing about all the gifts, actually, is that everybody benefits. Everybody profits. Amen. Uh, praise God. The word of wisdom is listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, that uh, <clears throat> we've read our text several times. We won't be reading the whole text today. And it's oftentimes included in the operation of all the other gifts. What do I mean by that? It oftentimes works along beside or in conjunction with other gifts of the Spirit. Sometimes a word of wisdom will come that will give instruction on what other type of ministry is needed. A word of wisdom can just come to me. I, Pastor Don could come for prayer or have a need in his life or a situation, and I'm saying, God, how can I help him? What do you want to do for him? And boom, a word of wisdom can come and say, Minister this way. Do this. You see what I'm saying? I'll probably share it with him. I'll say, the Lord told me, brother, to, you know, to...
pray this prayer for you or something like that, whatever it happens to be. So, but also it can, it can operate in conjunction with, um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking off the top of my head, Jesus heals the sick and he says, rise up, go and sin no more. That sounds pretty simple to us, but for that situation, it's a word of wisdom. What's the word of wisdom? Sin may have got you in this trap. Jesus is going to set you free. Don't go back and fall back in the trap. Y'all see what I'm saying? So it can operate in conjunction. It very often, commonly, may operate with the other vocal gifts. Okay, word of knowledge and word of wisdom oftentimes run together. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits can operate. In, they can operate in conjunction. Word of, uh, I said word of knowledge, it's tongues and interpretation. Can, there can be a tongues and interpretation and then a word of wisdom given. You know, in other words, this is many times how things will happen. Let's, let's, let's just say that I was giving a message. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge for destry. Okay, and we're going to talk about word of knowledge in a minute, but. So he gives me a word of knowledge. The Lord, I'm just making this up, okay? Give an okay, give us one. The guy who was talking about worship, I don't remember his name, but he Beautiful. said, yeah, he went on a, a rabbit trail for me because he said when we suffer with Christ, we'll be glorified with Christ. Even when you're serving with Christians, you can have to suffer underneath them. That spoke to me. That, yeah, okay, so that's a word of wisdom. It was prophetic because I wasn't doing it that uh -huh. way, Okay, so, yeah, it could also have been like a word of knowledge. Okay, God, sh did he speak it to you personally or to the group? Okay, okay, so anyway, a word of knowledge can reveal a need or a circumstance. And then the word of knowledge, just as the person speaking, could actually then shift to a word of wisdom. Okay, in other words, it could be like the Lord showing me that you struggled in this one area and, and then all of a sudden he says, and, and, and now, and he begins to, the Holy Spirit begins to explain a principle or something that is going to answer your, or give you the solution, answer your need, and give you direction. In other words. Whatever I said here has to remain confidence because I'm not here to point fingers at anybody in the body of Christ. I love everybody. Thank you. <laughs> That's your spiritual disclaimer. Okay. Well, it's just like, Pastor, we kind of just it's know, like don't put two James two 1 says, Counter all joy. Yeah. All 100%. Amen. And it tells us why, you know, it's, it's, it tells us the, the rewards, you know, the growth and, and the cry out, you know, the, and thank God for the things because we wouldn't, we wouldn't be going, we wouldn't be crying out if we didn't have that situation. Amen. We know how to cry out when trials come. Yes, when sir. Trouble comes, but that's a, that's a gift. That's right. And we're learning things through it. We Amen. Need to keep our mouth shut and speak the word of God, and we may learn about this new type of pen that's really durable, and we may know how to pray for people better by hanging around these wonderful people. God. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Amen. It can be what were you going to say, Miss Carolyn? I was going to say, you know, I explained to her this morning when I find myself in any kind of situation and it's become difficult, especially with ministry. Mm -hmm. Our prayer life needs to be more. Um, yeah. We have to rise up, you know, through faith because God, God is trying to show us something that's in us and need to be fixed. built on. Yeah, I they need to be fixed. Be Amen. Because it's He comes to help us, not to tear us down. He that's right. Yes, that's right. And you say you are an instrument. I mean, an instrument. Anybody you know when you're trying to play an instrument, you gotta continue to practice. practice. Yes. Until you become one, and the Holy Spirit is trying to become one with us through these tests and trials and tribulations. Iron sharpens iron. That's basically what to kind me. Painful. That's what that means. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Amen. All right. So we're getting some ideas here. Jesus' purpose, uh huh, not was only to for our salvation. For for our sins to be washed away white as snow, right, and, and to make us righteous, but the promise of the Father, yes, Amen, is the Holy Ghost, yes, because He knew that the generations before and all that came before only certain people, the the Spirit was upon them, yes, Amen, and now He says, "This is what it is." 
Mm -hmm. This is what promised me, Father. Amen. So he said, Father, I will die for them if you promise me that whoever calls upon my name Amen. shall be baptized yes. with the Holy Spirit. And, and because he knew we needed it, he mm -hmm. knew that the Holy Spirit was going to be, he's an enabler, he's a comforter, he's a guider, he's all that we need. Yes, he is. Him, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Y'all doing some good preaching today. Praise the Lord. That's absolutely right, guys. Beautiful. Uh, amen. <clears throat> so we need the Holy Spirit, uh, and we need wisdom from the Holy Spirit in order to carry out what God reveals to us. And uh, just in our bullet points here, it says how, uh, how do, we need to know how to do something that God has shown us. We need to know how to resolve situations, how to pray for a person, how to avoid dangers, how to speak the right words into situations. And a lot of these things listed here, many of you have just said that in one way or another. Amen. Some biblical examples here um, just of how this operates and works. Do you have your Bibles this morning? Um, Don, would you look up 2 Samuel 5, 22 through 25? Philip, you don't, you don't have a Bible, do you? No, it's okay, Philip. That's all right. We, we, no, we, afterwards we want we want witness to you and see if we can <laughs> lead you to the Lord, Philip. <laughs> hey, Bonte, bless you, Mary. You got a Bible? Could you look up? Oh, look up maybe First Kings three sixteen through twenty eight. Miss, you got a Bible, Destry? Okay. Would you like to do Acts fifteen thirteen through twenty one? Yes. And Miss Carolyn. How about um, Acts 5, 1 through 11? That one's a little long, but... Okay, has everybody got your scriptures? Uh, yours was 2 Samuel 5, 22 through 25. And when we read these Bible examples, we're going to see uh, some, some, some really clear examples of how this powerfully works. Amen? Praise the Lord. Good to see Miss Bonte. Amen. Are you ready, Don? I'm going to get it close to you so the mic will pick you up. Okay. Now the Philistines came up once again and spread their, themselves out in the valley of, of Rephaim. Uh, when David inquired of the Lord, he said, uh, You shall not go already up. Circle around behind them and come, in, uh, come at them in front of, of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of the marching of the tops of the balsam trees, uh, when you shall act promptly, and then you shall act promptly, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Then David did so, just as the Lord had commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from uh, Geba as far as Gezor. Good job. Yes. So what, what do you see there as a word of wisdom? Well, he was going to go up a certain direction, and the Lord said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. That's right. So God told him how to fight a battle, didn't he? Yeah. Amen. Good job, brother. But, uh, let's see. Where are we at? Mary? 1 Kings three sixteen through 28. Yep. It says, Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in the house, and I was delivered of the child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day that after I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thy handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other one said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they made before the king, and the king said to the one, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other said, Nay, but this is thy son that is dead, and my son is living. And this king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and get half to one and half to the other. And they spake in the woman living, and they spake the one who's the living child was son to the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she says, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and now they no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, mm -hmm. but divide it. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. 
She is the mother thereof. And all of Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the Lord, for they saw that the wisdom of God was with him to do judgment. That's a powerful story in there. You see the wisdom in that? Praise God. That's awesome, isn't it? Amen. Also on that, and service value would always look in the literal sense of that. Right. But also it can be the divided kingdom from the northern and southern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's good, yeah. You want to read yours? Yes, but it wasn't me. What is it? You're reading. It was Isaiah 53, 3 through 21. Uh, I think it's 15. I'm sorry? No, it's not. It's okay. 15, 13 through 21. Yeah. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Acts 15. Okay, got it. 13 through 21. And when they had ceased speaking, James rose up and said, Men and brethren, hear me. Simon Peter has told you how God from the beginning chose a people from the Gentiles for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will set up again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will repair what has fallen from it, and I will set it up, so that the men who remain may seek after the Lord, and also all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. So said the Lord, who does all these things? The works of God are known from the very beginning. Because of this I say, do not trouble those who turn to God from among gen the Gentiles, but let us send word to them that they abstain from defilement by the sacrifices to idols and from the fornications from the animals strangled from blood. For Moses to this very early centuries had preachers in the synagogues in every city to read his books on every Sabbath day. Amen. So we see another good example here <clears throat> of where divine wisdom is needed in order to solve a major problem in the local church. This was the church of Jerusalem. James is the half-brother of Jesus. We know that uh, through historical accounts and also right here in this particular passage of Scripture, it, it, it's pretty clear that James must have been the set man or the senior elder. We call them a pastor today. Uh, he led the church. They come in with a major controversy that needs to be resolved. The Bible, as she read, they're all contemplating. They're sharing their personal convictions and viewpoints. But finally, somebody has to get a word from God. And you notice where, he, where this word comes from? It comes back from the Old Testament, Amos, chapters 10, 9 and, chapters 10, verse 9 and 10. It's a prophetic word. But yet the Spirit brought that to life in him, and it spoke to the situation. And so it was a word of wisdom that would resolve conflict and unify the church and also allow the church to continue to go forward in what God was doing. So it was powerful, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. Um, okay, Sister Carolyn. Together with his wife's buyer, also sold a piece of property. With his wife full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but bought the rest and put it at the feet, at the apostles' feet. Then Paul, uh, Peter said, Ananias, how is it how is it that Satan has filled your heart? that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of, of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire 
to test the spirit of the Lord. Listen, the feet of the men who, bar who buried your husband at the door, they will carry you out also. Mm -hmm. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Whew. My, my, my. These were new believers, right? And were they baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because that was going on then. And they lied to God and still lied? Or, or were they not baptized? Were they really not baptized in the Spirit? I don't really know the extent of their relationship with the Lord. I just know that there, and the story itself makes, makes it very clear as we just read. They knew what they were doing. Uh, you know, they, they knew that they'd made a commitment and they conspired together to compromise that commitment. Basically, look, looking at it from where I'm looking at it, to make, give, to try to give the appearance to man they were being faithful and fulfilling the commitment. Failing to remember that God sees all. The Holy Spirit knew their heart and He knew what was going on. And the penalty was the ultimate. The Bible says in Old Testament too, uh, don't make a vow of God and then take it back. Yeah, it sure does. Because we, we, we seem to want to say, this got in the way, I need that or whatever. You know, and that just can cause all kinds That's right. Open doorways where the enemy will breach over and attack you. Yes, yes, and no, That's what happens. Right, right. It says better not to make the vow. Yep, yep. You're going to keep your word. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So let's hit on some just some uh, practical points here. Don't be impulsive in making decisions or giving advice. <clears throat> the next one: Don't act under pressure of people or circumstances. Ask the Holy Spirit for insight, for a word of wisdom, and what to do. Um, we realize that, too, that it can come as a spontaneous, uh, maybe a picture or an impression. Maybe it's a flow of thoughts. I think that just like we all have different ways that we learn, some of us learn auditorily, some of us learn visually, and there are multiple types of learning. Um, I think that's going to have uh, an, an influence on how we also hear from the Holy Spirit, uh, how He relates to us. Uh, that's why when we say it may be a spontaneous picture, an impression, flow of thoughts, more than likely it could you could receive things in all of those ways, but more than likely you're going to probably be more likely are apt to receive in a particular way just because of how God made you. He's going to communicate to you in the best way to get the message to you the clearest. <clears throat> if any of you are teachers uh, and you've studied multiple personality, not multiple personality, <laughs> multiple learning styles, <laughs> multiple, multiple personality, that's psychology. That's not good. Uh, multiple learning styles, then you understand what I'm talking about, that you want to always design your lesson to appeal to all the children in the class because there will be different ways that they learn. And that is not a, that is not a, there's nothing wrong with being that way. We're all made that way. So I want to take a break, uh, five minutes, okay? And we're going to come back and finish this, this lesson, okay? Yeah, Are you, does it interest you? Yeah, well, I had some people call me this week about it, and so I said, well, maybe it's time to do it then. Okay, good.
Maybe I just turned it off. He is not changed. Yes, it is changed. Oh, we, we, we all agree. No, he is still the same. But what I'm trying to do. continually to try to move them. And it is always God wanting to move them back. We don't know the timing nor the place as to when this person will get into this. Can you explain that? Can you explain that? To know the word of God and it doesn't seem like he's going to say God for everybody else. It's a Yeah. It looks like that. But we're looking at it with a finite mind. We're always going to look at it with a finite mind. He's looking at all the time. All the things. It's like uh, we have this. I have this, this battle in my mind about how how it is when certain people die of certain things and it's such a tragic thing. And the scripture that comes back to mind all the time: God knows your first day and your last. We just don't know how you're gonna leave on that last day. It never says you're gonna leave. Oh, uh, you're gonna leave by having a heart attack. And you're gonna leave by having a heart attack. You're just gonna leave. You're gonna die. 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 Now. In that intricate piece of that, that, there are people that are outside of this. Mm -hmm. Take Bolton John, for instance. Yeah, His right. days were numbered. Those were only the oh, numbers. So Bolton John, know. the guy that got yeah, killed by the police officer. Big trial. There was in Dallas. The guy that got killed. Yep. Oh, His yeah, days yeah, were yeah, numbered. Yeah. His oh, yeah. days oh, yeah. were yeah. numbered. So however, yeah. this, however, this number is. Yeah. Yeah. However, it's it's God, purpose, there is a whole story that's kind of connected from different things. Because of this one event, this happened. There's forgiveness that's shown out here. There's people over here. There's atheist people doing this. This girl gets saved. This Because we don't know all the high chart flow. It's just Yeah, it's just, this is just all we know. And so when everything, something happens, really tragic, the first scripture that comes to mind, God knows the number of your days. He knows the beginning from the end. And it's like, oh my God, I don't even know how. This yours? I, I don't like the I'm way it okay. We don't like the way it looks, but it is what it is. And we live in the whole world. Complete. Follow. Um, okay. Look, are you finished, Mary? Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't want to interrupt her. She's got it going on. Uh, does somebody have a piece of paper we could borrow? Yeah, would y'all, uh, th those that are interested, this is, no, that's yours, a blank piece. We could, if, if you're interested in this, I'm fixing to tell you about this program that's coming up. If you're interested in this, just put your email on it, and I'll send you the actual brochure to your email. So let me tell you what it's about. Um, we, I'm going to sit down for just a second. I got the email already. You did? Okay. Yeah, I sent it on the newsletter a while back ago. Um, in January... We want to start a program where um, uh, it's uh, it's going to be a, a really good uh, program. It's, it's 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 going to be life coaching. Life coaching is really really become popular in the last five to ten years. Um, and you'll see, and I'll just be right up front with you. You're going to see on the Facebook sometimes you're going to see a deal go by that says get certified in life coaching for twenty five dollars. Well. <laughs> Uh, if you just want a piece of paper, I'll do it for $25. <laughs> but I ain't putting integrity on it. <laughs> I'll put something like Goofus University on it or something like that. <laughs> so what, but what I'm saying is, is anytime there's something new 
you've got to be able to sort through what, you, what am I really getting for this? What we're going to do is we're going to teach a seminary university level life coach program. So it's going to be a year long. Um, you can actually get a degree in it if you don't have a degree already. There's no point in getting a degree in that if you already have a degree in something else. You know what I mean? The reason is, is because you already have a degree. <laughs> okay. Why? First of all, let me qualify this. Why a degree in anything? Because a degree establishes you as a professional. It makes, it makes the people that you want to help view you as a person who is prepared and capable of helping. So what does it do? It builds their confidence and trust in you. Okay? Yes. Wouldn't you want a degree for credibility? Oh, yes, yes. If, obviously, what I'm trying to say is, is if you absolutely don't have a degree, you can still take this program and just get a certificate. But I would recommend you get a degree in it. Okay? But for I'm saying for people who already have degrees, you it's optional. You can get a degree in it if you want another degree in this, along with what degree you have, or the next level degree. But if you if you really don't want to go through the whole process of another degree, you can just do the certification. It adds on to the degree you have as a certification, which which qualifies you well. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like this. Level one is certification, no degree. Okay. Level two would be to get a degree uh, and, you know, in life coaching. Of course, and then that goes by bachelor, master, doctorate, you know, that type of thing. Uh, uh, I guess level two would be when you already have a degree and you just get the certification and you use it along with your degree. The highest level would be to get a degree. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay, y'all got this. Y'all smart. Okay. <laughs> So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, is <clears throat> what it is, it's, um, it is a ministry approach to counseling, but it's a different approach. It's really powerful. The objective is, it's co called coaching because the objective is, is rather than like counseling, I have a degree in counseling. I know well, counseling is about giving people guidance and giving directions and helping them make decisions. Coaching is teaching them how to get their own guidance, make their own decisions, and choose their own destiny. Yes. It, it, coaching helps them learn how to get work done, how to organize their lives and ministry, and do it for other people. Listen, guys, there are people out there that are million and even billion dollar industries now that are all they do is organize people's drawers and closets. <laughs> there are people that all they do is organize the executive's office and their schedules and literally tell them, this is what you're going to do this week. You got a guy making six figures and he can't even keep his appointments straight. You know, he needs a coach, but instead of hiring a coach, he hires an assistant or, or somebody to do it for him. Y'all see what I'm saying? And probably pays more than if he'd just get a coach and learn how to do it himself. I'm just giving examples. The world is crazy about this concept and needing it. Um, so basically, you are going to help people have a blessed life, a more successful life in business or ministry. Um, you're going to help them in every area of life. Coaching, the initial class will be 12 months long, and it'll be about three hours once a month. Okay, on a, on a Saturday, three hours once a month on a Saturday, um, kind of like this class, except we'll, you know, we'll probably start at nine o'clock. You know what I mean? To get the three hours in, take a break after each hour to get coffee or use the restroom or get a drink. Um, and uh, we're, we will cover all the basics, everything in that list that I gave you kind of is just a synopsis. But we'll cover we'll cover what a coach is, what a coach does, how to how, how to help people methods. We'll cover we'll cover techniques, counseling. And when I say counseling, really, I mean coaching, uh, what to say, what to ask people. In other words, the idea is it's not so much going in and you trying to figure out their problem. It's getting them to talk. And then, then you diagnose them. You, you say, okay, you know, and most, most of the clients you're going to have, well, they'll tell you, I'm terrible, you know, at this. Uh, I can't seem to get this off the ground. God has put this on my heart and I can't get it going. You're going to help them get things going. Um, would it, would it consist of former four, four formats? Like, you know, it may be areas of, uh, when I say formats, uh, 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 
uh, this of what we can look for, what we can have them, you know, to kind of you know, outline? Yes, it, yes. It, 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 this, is this is going to be techniques and how to do it. Okay? Even to the point of, <clears throat> um, well, let me, let me look at the sheet here to remind my, 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 my. Uh, let, let me just read some. So listen to this here. Models for developing change in people. Effective relational principles that secure clients and allow for trust necessary to unlock their personal potential and professional success. Okay? In other words, what these are are like formulas. They're like, in other words, here's what you do. Here's what you say. Uh, even, we're even going to talk about marketing. How do you get it out there to let people know you, you're available to help them? Uh, how do you organize your own business? How do you handle people? We're going to talk about what is reasonable to charge. <clears throat> if, when, when I, if you haven't already got the actual red brochure, I'm going to email you one. If you sign up on that list, I'll email you one. And I give some actual research examples of the what, pe what, what coaches are making. Um, you know, and really, it's like anything. It's it's how how much time do you want to put in? Y'all know what I mean. <clears throat> and also, how much do you want to charge? And who do you want to target? The way, what am I going to? We're going to do for the first twelve months. We're going to teach you what you need to know to be a coach and be successful at it. Then, <clears throat> after that, we're go we're going to offer um, just short one day uh, certificates. They'll be like three or four hours on a Saturday. Um, here and there, and you pick what you're interested in. For example, you can specialize. You can be a, a coach in general to anybody for any reason, and, and, and you do great ministering to people and helping people. Or you can say, I want to specialize in marriage, helping married couples. I want to specialize in executives, okay? In other words, those are the high paying ones. But in other words, we'll have, we'll have a whole day of training on how to you, how do you coach an executive? How do you coach someone who's on the 110th floor in Dallas and everybody on, on the 110 floors below him, he's their boss, you know? These guys, believe it or not, they're the ones who use coaches, you know? But anyway, uh, there's coaches on just coaching men, just coaching women. There's, we, we're going to do a specialty on, um, in other words, we, I have a list of 20 different specialties. And basically what I'll do is, is if I have two or three people even that's interested in a specialty, it's worth doing it. Okay. If nobody's interested in one that we advertise, then we'll probably skip that one because there's such a variety of different ones. All right. I wish I'd have brought a brochure. I didn't bring it with me. So now. I don't know which is whose. Did I answer some of your questions? Uh, one question I got through. What are your costs? The cost. Okay, if you want to get a degree in it, it's the, that's the normal tuition price, which most of you know what that is. Bachelor's is one eighty nine right now. Uh, master's is two thirty nine. Dual degrees two eighty nine. Doctor's three nineteen. But if you already are working on a degree or you have a degree and you say, look, you know, I really don't think I need to get another degree. I just want to add the certification. It's $99 a month. So, and you get the same teaching. Okay. It's a whole year. Okay. Uh, for what level? Degree. Bachelor's is 189. The master's is 239. Dual degrees 289. And the doctor is 319. But now, you know how degrees are. I don't know what all you have. But in other words, if you don't have a bachelor's, you got to do that first. Then you do a, You can do a master's. If you don't have a, if you don't, if you don't have a, if you have a bachelor's, you can do a master's. If you have a master's, you can do a doctor. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, you don't have to go back and start over. The only, thank you. The only thing about this is, because this is so unique and every class is going to be so critical to your learning, you, you can't say, okay, I'm, I'm already uh, halfway through with a degree in theology and I just want to shift over and finish. If you do, you're going to get half of what you need. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying? So really what you probably need to do is finish that degree in theology, if that applies to you, and do this in addition. If you want a degree in it. What you can do is you can say, I'm getting a degree in theology for just $99 a month. I'm going to attach it. You know, in other words, I'm going to get a certification to go along with it. 
So is that interesting to y'all? Yeah, so I, I already see it. I, the timing is right, I can tell, because I've, I've already had two people jump on board just in the last 48 hours, you know. And I'm not talking about any of y'all. So. Okay, so anyway, um, y'all pray about it and think about it. If it interests you, if it don't interest you, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I'll tell you, we don't just do this for the fun of it. We really pray and ask God, what does he want us to offer and what does he want... You know what? What is he leading people? Or what, what? What? What's working out there? And 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 then you know. And I don't mind telling you, when we do something like this, we weren't born knowing everything. <laughs> we have to really put time and study into it, and we have to also pay for our the materials we get. No, so what I'm saying is, is I'm not just saying we're going to do this and I'll just make it all up. No, we're going to teach you right, the right stuff in the right way, and we're, in, we're investing into it. So, you know, okay? So I can tell you this much. I cannot tell you which Saturday it'll be, but it'll be on a Saturday. Okay? And we'll know that within probably a couple weeks. Okay? And, but it'll be just like this, one Saturday a month and uh, for 12 months. Okay? Okay. Thank you all for that. Uh, time. <clears throat> so, uh, we've, we've just been talking about the word of knowledge. And, uh, let's see. No, we just finished, we just finished word of wisdom, didn't we? Where are we at? Somebody tell me. Yeah, I don't have those kind of numbers. 15-3. Okay, let me just hit a couple practical points real quick okay. so we can kind of wrap that up. Uh, don't be impulsive in making decisions or giving advice. I, these are really pretty understandable, easy points. Uh, don't act under pressure or of people, or oh, I did do these, or circumstances. And then ask the Holy Spirit for insight, for a word of wisdom and what to do. Good. Okay, so we actually did do these. We talked about some people get a picture, an impression. Some people might just get a flow of thoughts. So we're moving to point 16, word of knowledge. Word of knowledge. So what is a word of knowledge? Word of knowledge is an impression, a thought, a mental picture, or the still voice of the Holy Spirit, giving knowledge of facts about a person or situation that one could not possibly have known naturally. Okay, so key to the word of knowledge is something obviously you don't know about that person because the Holy Spirit's going to give you that message to give. Next thing is, <coughs> is it's going to reveal something to the person. <coughs> Y'all pardon me for coughing. Uh, in the light of that, so um, we're calling this, this is, or this is, God calls this a word of knowledge. It's not accumulated or acquired knowledge. It's revealed knowledge. Okay. This is something that the Holy Spirit will show you about a situation or a person. Um, and uh, it will be a blessing to them because it will also show them something and give them direction. It's knowledge about past situations and experiences or about current situations. It uncovers what is happening. It uncovers what is happening. So why would God use a gift like this? Uh, through his people, obviously, we know that it is to profit with all, isn't it? Okay? So everybody's going to be blessed, especially the one who's receiving the, directly the gift. But all of us are going to be blessed to some degree. Uh, it uncovers important unknown facts concerning a person or a situation. It also uncovers the true situation as seen from God's perspective. I know that you know this, but in every place we find ourselves, particularly in the midst of storms and struggles, there are factors we don't see, right? There are things that, we, you know, we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to get through this test. God sees everything. And so God, in his divine godness, <laughs> if that makes any sense, 
He's able to, through a word of knowledge, speak into your life through someone to give you clarity, understanding, to give you insight that otherwise you don't have access to. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So it uncovers the true situation as seen from God's perspective. It enables you to minister more effectively to the needs of people. Word of knowledge is, to me, a very powerful gift because word of knowledge will grasp people. When you say the Lord's showing me something and they're going, hey, there's no way he can know about this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Only God knows this. Or maybe maybe my friends know this or my spouse know this, but this guy doesn't know this. This girl doesn't know this. What, what happens? Your dog ears stand up, don't they? Right. And you're ready to hear what's the Lord got to say about this. Okay, so it's, it gives you that edge in ministry. Uh, some biblical examples, y'all feel like reading a little bit more? Okay, I'll start on this side. Miss Carolyn, if you'll take the first one there, first, uh, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 10. And then Miss Destry, if you'll take 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 20. Uh, and uh, Miss Mary, 2 Kings 5, 20 through 27. Page six. Right? Yeah. The scriptures are, yeah. yeah. They are? Yeah, that's yeah. page six. Yeah. You got the whole scripture? No, no just the whole story. I'm I'm looking. Oh, just the story. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought you got something I don't have. <laughs> okay. Um, where are we at here? We we got Mary. What what I give you, Mary? Okay. So um yeah, you you can you don't have you can just tell us what it means. It's just one verse. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Miss uh, uh, Bonte, you want to take uh, Acts five one through eleven, and then uh, Elder Don, Acts nine, ten through sixteen, <clears throat> and I'm gonna come over here by Miss Carolyn. Elijah traps blind Armenians. Uh, Armenians. Okay. Armenians. Okay. Armenians. Okay. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elijah warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Okay, amen. So what we see here is Elijah's receiving details about the enemy strategy. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Destry, you want to read yours? Yeah, 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 20. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord had told Samuel a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be ruler over my people Israel. And he shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen the oppression of my people, and their cry has come to me. And when Samuel saw Saul, saw Saul, whom the Lord had chosen, then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, the man whom I spoke to you, this man shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel at the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, and said, I am the seer, go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and in the morning I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. And as for your asses that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the hope of the house of Israel is not on you and on your father's house? And Saul, oh, that's it. No, that's good. Okay. So we see here that, again, 
uh, the man of God receives uh, knowledge, word of knowledge, basically, about King Saul and about what's going on there. Amen? Second Kings. Yeah. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, his, this, uh, this Syrian, and in not receiving at his hand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me some mount, from Mount Ephraim two young men of the son of the prophets. Give them, I pray, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garment and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from his hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said unto him, Whence thou comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not, went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariots to meet thee, is it time to receive money, to receive garments, and alveyard, and vineyard, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went from his friends as a leper, white as snow. Amen. So now we can see that it can also reveal sin, right? Okay. Pastor Phil? And the same here. I want to just uh, always want to get it. Sure. Not just that verse because you got to get context. And the woman answered and said to her, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're correct. I have mm -hmm. no husband. For you have had five husbands, and one who you have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Wow. So she was a shacker. <laughs> so, so, uh, I today, so you can hey, you hit it on the nail, brother. She was, she was a lonely woman who was trying to get her needs met, and she went she and she found easy. the living water. And unlike Nicodemus, she went out and she told people about it. And after the verse after that is about white for the harvest. The harvest. She did exactly what we're to do. We're just supposed to speak it, and speak. all the men of the village and all the people came to Jesus. Right. Amen. She left her water pot there, which could have been she left her burden there, or or to or he left she left the water there so Jesus could drink. I don't know, but what does it mean? She left her water pot there. I don't know. Well, we all got testimonies. They said, "Go and tell, say, tell what happened to you." <laughs> she left we all her got sin there. Stories. She did, didn't she? She was empty, and then she was bubbling she over, and she sin. shared the bubbling over. Amen. Amen. Bonte. Acts 5, 1 mm -hmm. to 11, line to the Holy Spirit. But a certain man named Ananias with, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit of the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. 
Amen. 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 So we see another example from this story where God reveals financial dealings. <laughs> right? Amen. Pastor Don? Okay, uh, it's going to be Acts 9, 10 through 16. Now there, there, were disciple, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, <clears throat> Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is, a, is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he, had, he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he is with authority, or here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and every one of these stories mm -hmm. that we just heard that we read has one thing in common. Mm -hmm. They all received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They all received. That's good, Philip. Yeah, like high place. Why do you have to go to the high place for this? High places were bad things back then, right? Were they did idolatry? Yeah, the high places typically were um, pagan worship places. Yeah, yeah places of worship. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, I, because I haven't yeah. studied it, I can't really. I I'd just be. Okay. You know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah. We can break it down in today's interpretation. <laughs> okay. they, they have a culture call today, you know, that where that high place or that sinful place is that many people makes their path and goes there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you ask a sinner that's in sin, he'll tell you where he you can go. Amen. You know, they know. That's right. They, all the birds flock together. To sin yeah, that's what they say. Boys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I thank God that. Well, it's, it's women's too. Women's too. Because it's the women's that's there. Yeah. They're part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, just touch on some practical points here. Uh, this may come as a spontaneous picture or an image. An imagination, an impression, or a flow of thoughts, or inner knowing, which is just like the other uh, revelation gifts kind of come. A word of knowledge may come as a dream or a vision. It may give you sudden insight about sickness, bondage, and other types of problems. To operate effectively in the word of knowledge, you must separate your own knowledge from that which the Holy Spirit gives. It is possible to start in the Spirit and end up in the flesh. We have to be real careful, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, like, if you see a particular image or a picture, if you feel an impression, you want to focus on that and describe what you see. But it's not our place to try to interpret it or tell what it means. Let them, uh, let them just hear what the Lord is saying. He's communicating to them. They're going to understand what He wants them to understand. Ask the Lord for specific details. Ask uh, how to wisely use what you know. Uh, it may mean a little to you. It may mean nothing to you. Or it may, may be dramatic to you. But in any case, you just are there to speak it. Uh, what, you want to wait on the Lord and they want to wait on the Lord. Encourage people that when God speaks that there's always a timing that is associated with any and everything he does. And because God doesn't live in the framework of time like we do, to God everything's happening right now, you know. But to us, five minutes is five minutes. <laughs> five days is five days. Five months is five months, five years. But to God, it's, he sees it all. Yeah, so we have to realize that timing is in the Lord's hands. God will do what He says He will do. And if we obey any directive or information or insight He gives, then He will respond to His Word. But we have to trust Him patiently and wait upon Him to do that. Um, <clears throat> and so... Um, and it's, it's perfectly fine to say, God, when you know someone's hurting, when you know there's a need, it's perfectly fine to pray and say, Lord, could you give me something that would help them? 
Amen? There's nothing wrong with desiring God to use you. Okay? It's no different than a pastor who prays and studies and seeks God to preach on Sunday morning. You know what they're doing? God, I want a word for your people. God, what do you have to say that's going to help the people? Because a good pastor, a good teacher, all of us, we know that, that on our best day, we can't even come close to what God can do if we let Him lead us and guide us. Amen? <coughs> that's right. That's right. I remember uh, I was going to Christian college, and I remember that, that the professor, an evangelist, he said, you know why you're not a soul winner? Hmm. And, then, and, then, and then he said, because you're not asked God to make you a soul winner. Wow. That's right. And I, I, I got yeah. right out of bed. Yeah. And thank God for that. That's good. Praise the Lord. Uh, when you're going to be giving a word of knowledge, you want to consider a few things. Um, you just ask yourself and ask the Lord right there, God, is this a word of knowledge? Lord, are, are you showing this to me? Uh, and then you want to say, Lord, is this something that I need to take to whoever's in charge before I share it? And it, it, it'll, have, it'll have to do with where you're at at the time. Uh, obviously, if you're in a church meeting and church is going on, um, and it's a word of knowledge for the body or something, you want to be sensitive to the culture of the church. Some churches, the culture is, is that you come and you ask the minister, the, or, or an, an elder or a deacon or somebody, they may want you to share it with them, and then, then you will be given access to share it, particularly in really big churches. <clears throat> but in smaller churches, perhaps the culture may allow you to freely be used of God, and uh, which, if that's the culture, then you just want to be sensitive about the timing, that you don't interrupt what the Holy Spirit's doing here in order to do what you have. You want to be sensitive to a point to where it is appropriate. Okay, And then be aware that if you do it publicly without getting some type of clearance, uh, 